Well, let's turn back in our Bibles to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, the place where we've reached as we've worked our way through this great book in these last weeks and months together. And we come, of course, this evening to the Apostle Paul's ministry in the great city of Athens. I had a colleague once who, on one occasion, he was an American, and he on one occasion, entertained the great Welsh preacher Martin Lloyd-Jones to dinner in his home. Years afterwards, when he was describing this occasion to me, he said to me very definitely, very definitely, he was, he said, an enormous man. In actual fact, Dr. Lloyd-Jones was of very moderate size and probably little more than average height. And it struck me very forcefully that the memory, the recollection of his presence with my colleague was far larger than his actual physical size. And as we read through the Acts of the Apostles, perhaps particularly in these recent weeks as the Gospel has come to what we now call Europe and there has been this almost balancing of riots and revivals following the preaching of the gospel, we might get the sense that there was a whole army of people invading Europe. These people who have turned the world upside down have come here also, was what was being said. But as far as we can actually see, there were only four of them. There was the Apostle Paul and there was Silas. And then on the way they had picked up young Timothy. And then at Troas, as we discovered a few weeks ago, the author of the Acts of the Apostles, Luke, had joined them. And we begin to see in the rest of this marvelous book those we passages in which the author of the Acts is so obviously present with the apostolic band. Just four men. And if they're not turning the world upside down, they certainly seem to be turning these cities upside down. And the remarkable thing is that they don't stay together all of the time. One can almost imagine that Luke, having joined them and been in Philippi with them, this is his first experience of an apostolic mission. It must have been overwhelming to see the power of the gospel at work and also to see the power of opposition, rioting, difficulty, trial, beatings. Perhaps it was out of consideration for Luke that the Apostle Paul said to him as he left Philippi, you just stay here for a little while. I'm not sure you're ready yet for what's about to happen in the next places that we visit. And so they had moved from Philippi and they had begun the great exploration of the great country that we now call Greece. Paul had preached in Thessalonica. He had preached in Berea. Large numbers of people had been converted. And then because those days of revival and awakening were accompanied with riots, it was thought fit to remove the Apostle Paul almost as far as they could possibly remove him and still keep him on the landmass. And so they sent him on a cruise down the side of Greece and eventually on his own he comes to Athens and he's there for probably a couple of weeks waiting for his beloved companions to come and join him. And he does what you or I would do in Athens. He goes sightseeing. He goes sightseeing. But actually, in a way, you can tell where this man is spiritually. Because if you were to say to him, what did you see in Athens? It's very clear that what the Apostle Paul saw was very different from what others saw. This was the great city that a few centuries before had been the epicenter of philosophy. This was the city 
of Socrates. This was the city of Plato. This was the city of Aristotle. The whole of Western philosophy was from this point onwards a footnote to these three extraordinary thinkers and beyond that the art and the glory that was Athens. And although Athens is now in decline it's obvious from this narrative that it still feels itself to be something of a city. Men wise enough to be able to decide the great issues of religion. Men and women who love to hear the latest news, to talk about the latest thing. It was, in some ways in the ancient world, the first modern, if not post-modern city. A variety of religions. Every few years, something new attracting the attention of the people. And man the measure of all things. Man deciding God's place in society. And we're told in this moving way that Luke has of describing the ministry of the Apostle Paul in verse 16. That while he was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked. His spirit had a paroxysm. His spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. And his sight-seeing tour ended when he saw that. His sight-seeing tour became an evangelistic tour. And he was determined in Athens that he would find ways of bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people. And it's very interesting to see what his response is to then contemporary idolatry. It teaches us something actually about the Christian and the church's response to now contemporary idolatry. He doesn't go into the streets and shout, you are idol worshippers. He doesn't go with his hammer and become an iconoclast and break down the idols. He does something very significant, we're told. He goes into the synagogue and he goes into the marketplace and he reasons with the people. And this, of course, is something that he has learned to do. He has learned to understand the needs of men and women. He's learned, in a sense, to understand the ways in which those needs manifest themselves. He's learned to understand the particular shape that man's rebellion against God takes. And he believes with all his heart that the Christian gospel can stand its ground in the intellectual capital of the world. And while he understands that it is not possible to reason somebody to conversion. He does believe with all his heart that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the one truth that is consistently reasonable. And you notice that he does three things, essentially. He looks for three things. Number one, he looks for a point of contact with the people to whom he is speaking the gospel. He asked himself the question, how can I bring the gospel to bear on the needs of this situation? The second thing he does, in addition to looking for a point of contact, which of course he finds in verse 22, in the fact that they are very religious. But now you see he looks for a second thing. In verse 23, he looks for the point of inconsistency. Now let me pause and just try and emphasize to you how important both of these things are. That we look first of all for the point of contact that the gospel has with men and women in the world. And the same thing that was true of the Athenians is actually true even of the most hard-bitten atheist. He or she is by nature and creation a religious being. 
made for the worship of God. Malfunctioning so long as he or she is not worshipping God. And as we shall see here, the Apostle Paul makes a great deal of this point of contact. But second, the point of inconsistency. What do I mean by this? I mean by this, that the unbelieving man, the unbelieving woman, can never be consistent in his or her unbelief. The unbelieving man or woman can never be consistent in his or her unbelief. And Paul sees this. He says, you are very religious, and the multiplicity of your expressions of religion demonstrate to me that your religion has not led you to the place that your religion professes. Because I saw the altar to the unknown God. In other words, he is saying, you profess a religion that satisfies and that brings you to God. And the very indication here in Athens is that your religion neither satisfies nor has it brought you to God. And the third thing the Apostle Paul does is this. He looks to the basic principles of the Bible story. He looks to the basic principles of the Bible story. In other words, he understands that in that world, as increasingly in our world, and ever increasingly in our world, we are not speaking to men and women who have the Bible, though they may possess a copy. They don't know the Bible. If the statistics are anything to go by, there is an extraordinary ignorance, even at the highest levels of education, of what is in the Bible. You watch the quiz shows and you know that the questions most of the people in the quiz shows will not be able to answer are the questions about the Bible. The simplest questions about the Bible. And so, it isn't really sufficient for us simply to quote a text here or a text there. I suppose from one point of view, the Apostle Paul could have gone among the Athenians and said, God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But it would have been mumbo-jumbo to them. And so he understood that he had to begin with the Bible's big picture, with the Bible's whole story. And to explain the Bible's whole story to men and women, as Francis Schaeffer, some of you will remember, used to say, to men and women without the Bible. And so he goes back. He looks for biblical first principles. Now, that's evangelism for Paul in a pagan world in a nutshell. Look, he says, for the point of contact. Look, he says, for the point of inconsistency and inadequacy. And look for the Bible's basic plot line. And explain how the Bible's basic plot line is the very story out of which the reasonable of the Christ reasonableness of the Christian faith is demonstrated and the adequacy of Jesus Christ to save sinners is made known. And as we do this, we find the Apostle Paul urging upon these Athenians five fundamental truths. Those three points were simply preliminary to the five points. So fasten your safety belt for a moment as we turn to these five points. I'll deal with them very quickly. Five points that the believer understands about the truth of the gospel from which frequently the unbeliever is hiding. Now that's again a very important principle in our evangelism. This is a principle that gives us confidence in our evangelism. We know something about the unbeliever that the unbeliever is denying about himself. We know that he's on a flight from God. 
We know that he's a rebel against God and therefore he or she will use every possible defense mechanism to defend themselves against God, to deny God's power, to deny God's grace, even to deny God's revelation. But the Apostle Paul is teaching us here as he teaches us in Romans chapter 1 that it isn't actually ultimately consistently possible to do that. So that when you are witnessing to somebody, you know something about them that they are denying to you and may even be denying to themselves. And so Paul makes the point of contact and then he gets through the point of inconsistency. And he opens up the story of God's saving revelation. Now what are these five points that emerge from Paul's teaching to the Athenians as he's brought before the Areopagus. Now this is not just a, this is not just another preaching opportunity for Paul incidentally. Paul is before the Areopagus because the Areopagus is the body in the city of Athens that decides religious issues. And the great question before the Areopagus as Paul is brought to them is this. We wish to know, verse 20, What these things mean. Now here's what these things mean. First of all, you are surrounded, says Paul, by the revelation of God. Verses 24 through 26. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything. He himself gives life to all mankind and breath to everything. And he made man. Now Paul's point is this. You Athenians are living in a world that is a theater of God's revelation. He has made everything that is. There is, as it were, stamped upon all things, as it were, underneath it or running through it, Created by God. Turn anything upside down, the apostle is saying, as you might do today, and it says made in China, or or might even be an American flag, and it says made in China. And he's saying, as this universe surrounds you, it surrounds you as a creation. You cannot get to grips with anything without having some sense that this universe is a theater of God's glory so that as the great Dutchman Hermann Bavink used to say, there is actually nothing in the universe that is ultimately atheistic. Isn't that something? You know, it gives you great strength in your Christian witness when you realize that. There is nothing in the universe that is ultimately atheistic. Everything in the universe in a sense, says, I am created by God. And Paul is urging upon these Athenians an understanding that this God is not a God that you lock up in a little monument or in a little piece of stone or in a statue. The idea is ludicrous that you could reduce the creator of the universe to something in the universe. And all the time, you see, really without using the language of the Bible, he's communicating the message of the Bible, the message of Genesis chapter 1. There is no where you can go to escape from the revelation of God. It's almost like the 139th Psalm, if I took the wings of the morning and flew with the speed of light to the uttermost parts of the earth. What would I find there as I fled from the revelation of God where I am and got as far away as possible as I possibly could? I would land lightly with the wings of the morning and the revelation of God would be staring me in the face. There is no last exit from revelation. Men and women are surrounded by it every day of their lives. This is why one of the Christian believers at the time of the French Revolution, when a revolutionary said to him, we will pull down your steeples so that you will not be reminded of your superstitions. 
And he replied, yes, but you cannot rip the stars out of the sky. Surrounded by divine revelation. I was talking to Duff James the other day about the possibility of going to see Amazing Grace. And he knows I've been to a movie theater twice in the last 40 something years. And he's been very gentle with me. And he said one of the differences you'll notice now is that there is surround sound. Wow. Now you see that's our world. The unbeliever finds him or herself in a world of surround sound. And that is why the unbeliever cannot consistently escape the revelation of God. Because even the unbeliever in this world of surround sound wants to say, isn't that wonderful? To somebody. While with his lips he says there is no somebody there. He wants to say how. How has this been brought into being? The great naturalists. The humanistic. Secularistic. Agnostic or atheistic naturalists. What are they so often appealing to? Isn't mother nature wonderful? You see. There's no escape. From a universe that is a revelation of God. But more than that, says Paul. Not only are they surrounded by the revelation of God. But he goes on to emphasize and he seems to suggest there's even a sense in which they have an understanding of this. That they are invaded by the revelation of God. Look at what he says here in verse 22. He says, you are very religious. And you see what he's saying. He's saying there's something deep down within you. For all the philosophies that have been worked out in this great city over the years, there is something deep down within you that is religious. That is to say that corresponds to the revelation of God. And so he goes on to quote their own poets. We are indeed his offspring. We are his likeness. And this of course is again the story of Genesis 1. God making man male and female as his image. So that men and women only, only can make sense of themselves as they are related to the one whose image they are. So in a sense... Paul is saying, it's not just that you can't escape from the surround sound of God's revelation. It is that you're actually part of that revelation yourself. You're made as his image. You're made as his likeness. You're made to function as a religious person, to worship him. As that other great Dutchman of the 19th century, Abraham Kuyper used to say, if the creation is a theater of God's revelation, then man is both spectator and actor. The revelation is in you, in your very being. God, you remember how Ecclesiastes has put it? God has set this into man's heart. God has set eternity into man's heart so that there is no escape no escape from the revelation outside of me no escape from the echoing of that revelation inside of me and it's this that leads Paul to his third point and it is that although we are surrounded by the revelation of God and invaded by the revelation of God, we have become spiritually ignorant despite the revelation of God. And you see all of this scenery, he is saying, is an indication to me that although God has surrounded you with revelation of himself, invaded you with revelation of himself in so far as you are his offspring. 
Now, those of you who are my age, or perhaps a little younger, have you ever had this experience? Some of you probably have it a little more frequently than others, that, that you do something, you respond to a situation, you say, where did that response come from? Where did that come from? And as you step back, you get a flashback to your father about the same age, responding to the same situation, almost exactly the same way. And you say, I, I didn't think I was anything like that. And that's what he's speaking about. He's speaking about the fact that we can never escape the fact that we are his offspring. But because we have rejected his revelation, we have become ignorant of him. And there is a great symbol of this in the midst of Athenian religion. It's this altar that Paul has, you can almost see him bending down on his knees. I could almost imagine he got quite excited. As he thought, how am I going to communicate the gospel to these Athenians? I know how to go to the synagogue and preach the gospel to the Jews. I can open the scriptures to them. But what text am I going to use when I speak to these pagans? And he finds his text on a stone in Athens. The unknown God. And he's got it, you see. God in his providence has put into his hands the point of inconsistency that he can press upon. How is it that you understand God has revealed himself in creation? How is it that you are so religious and yet none of your religion has led you to any real sense that you've come to know God? It's not led you to any real sense of fellowship with God. It's not led you to any real sense of assurance of your salvation and your future destiny forever in heaven with God. And that's a not inconsiderable point, incidentally, to press home with people. Well, how assured are you? Your new religion. How assured does it make you? And you see, he's simply saying here, in other words, the very things he says in Romans chapter 1, verse 18 following. That although in one sense they knew God, in the real deep down sense, they were rebelling against the God they knew really was, and rejecting him. And their ignorance, therefore, was a culpable ignorance. You see, that's why he doesn't immediately say, Jesus. That's why he pauses to put everything into the big picture. Because he wants them to see that they'll never understand the significance of the ministry of Jesus until they understand that God has so marvelously revealed himself in creation that, as Paul says in Romans 1, I am utterly inexcusable for not falling down before him and worshipping him and adoring him and giving my whole life to him. And so he presses home their ignorance that they themselves confess. Now, isn't that interesting? Isn't that the very thing that somebody who says he or she is an agnostic is confessing? I don't know. I don't know. But you see, you begin to press. And you realize that I don't know is not simply a matter of neutral reasoning. It's a matter of heart rebellion against the God who has created them. They don't want to know, is the point that Paul is making. And then this fourth thing. They're surrounded by the revelation of God. They're invaded by the revelation of God. They're ignorant spiritually despite the revelation of God. But the good news of the gospel is this. That God has given an opportunity to repent and to be forgiven because of the new revelation of God. Sometimes people say, you know, Paul went to Corinth and 
He says, when I went to Corinth, I was determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. As though what Paul was saying there was, I gave up all this reasoning with people. It was such a disaster in Athens. But you notice he did preach the gospel to them, didn't he? That was why he was dragged before them in the first place. Because he was proclaiming Jesus in the resurrection. And now he comes and he says, now listen, God has in history, as it were, been patient with the times of your ignorance. Verse 30. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now you see the point he's making. Before they shout him down, the point he is making is this. That God has given you the opportunity and the invitation to repent. Now we need to understand something that Paul makes clear elsewhere. And I think it's altogether possible he made clear here. But Luke doesn't tell us in this summary that the only thing that makes it possible to repent is the knowledge that God will forgive. That's the only thing that makes it possible to repent. Condemnation, the condemnation of the law makes it possible to feel guilty. But nobody ever repents without the prospect of being forgiven. That's why our Westminster Confession of Faith speaks about repentance being born in us, not simply by the guilt that comes from our sinful condemnation, but by the hope of pardon that's to be found in Jesus Christ, who was crucified for our sins and raised again, says Paul in Romans 4.24, for our justification. But you see, as soon as he's pointed them to the, the historical reality of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, they're on his case. They don't want to hear any more. They're mocking him and they're despising him. And in doing so, they are further hardening their hearts against the revelation of God. And this is why the Apostle Paul says a fifth thing. That they face the judgment that will consummate the revelation of God. They're surrounded by the revelation of God. They're invaded by the revelation of God. They're ignorant despite the revelation of God. They're given an opportunity to repent through the new revelation of God in Jesus Christ. And they face the judgment that will consummate the revelation of God. And he's pressing upon them that it's not just an opportunity to turn and to seek Christ and to find forgiveness. It's an absolute necessity for them. Lest they fall under God's final judgment and be condemned by Christ himself. Now this is not where he begins, but the Apostle Paul is driven, among other things, by a deep concern that apart from responding to the gospel of Jesus Christ, men and women remain under the wrath of God. And it's that that sent him into a paroxysm of compassion passion that drove him all on his own, none of his companions, to bring the message of the gospel to these philosophers in Athens. He found the point of contact. He found the point of inconsistency. He brought home the gospel by pointing them to Jesus Christ. And the gospel actually bore its characteristic fruit. There were some who hardened their hearts and mocked. And there were some 
who joined. Some who mocked. Some who joined. We need to be clear that our own Christian witness will always have the same effect. Mocking and joining. And as we reason out of the scriptures, as Paul is doing, whether we refer to the scriptures or not, the Apostle Paul is teaching us to reason out of the scriptures. And as we reason out of the scriptures, men and women, boys and girls, bow before Jesus Christ and are saved from the wrath of God. It was a monumental day in Athens. And Paul gives us just a little hint of that as presumably afterwards he and Luke talked and he said, you know, some joined us and believed among whom was Dionysius the Areopagite right at the very heart of the Areopagus Dionysius is saved and a woman named Damaris and others with them would to God that it would be true also in Colombia our Heavenly Father we thank you for the instruction of your word. We thank you for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry that comes through its teaching. And we pray very specially tonight that you would embolden us in this knowledge. That we live in a world of surround sound revelation. That those to whom we speak the gospel cannot escape the echoes of that revelation that they are indeed invaded by it help us we pray to have the insight and the wisdom and the courage to show the inconsistency of living in unbelief and rejection of the true and living God and grant O oh God that through our witness there may be many who will join even if there are some who will mock. Give us grace and courage for this, we pray. In Jesus, our Saviour's name.